If you're ready to buy a home, I'm ready to help. Let's do it. I'm so excited that you are ready to buy a home. And in this video, I want to make it a wise use of your time. So we're going to talk about how to buy a home in Dallas, Texas, and just an overview of what you can expect. So it's not always possible for me to have a face-to-face, -face, especially in this pandemic environment, a face-to-face -face with every single client. So let's just consider this our buyer's consultation and we can do a follow-up call a little bit later. The very first place that I wanna start is choosing a real estate agent. That's already done, so let's just move on to the next part. Okay, okay, seriously though, if you're watching this video for educational purposes or maybe you don't live in the Dallas area, let's talk just briefly about how to choose a real estate agent. Now, if you're buying a home, you would call them a buyer's agent and they mostly work for free unless you read the fine print in your contract that you signed with them or something they have you paying some additional type of fee but i can tell you that if they're worth their salt a good buyer's agent can work for free we work for you and we are actually paid by the seller when you go under contract and close on your home the seller is actually paying us and that's nine out of ten cases so how do you choose a real estate agent it's really simple look at the experience look at their reputation and an often overlooked area, chemistry, because you may be working with them for the next two to six months or however long, and you need to be able to get along with them. They need to pick up the phone when you call and respond to you. You need to feel like your questions are being answered and that you're not bothering them. So that chemistry between you and the agent is very important. And yes, the experience that they know what they're doing, that they can certainly get you to the closing table under your terms with a good deal and that they have a good reputation out there in the community. So pay attention to reviews and maybe talk to a few people that they've worked with in the past. But there are plenty of good agents out there. There really are and some not so good ones. So do your due diligence, interview a few, and most importantly, choose the one that you have great chemistry with that can get the job done. All right, getting lender approval such a key area you absolutely want to do this first before you jump right out and start home shopping i have a few horror stories about clients who just wanted to bypass this all together they went out there and fell in love with the home and were heartbroken when they weren't able to qualify for that home you really need to shop intelligently with all the information in front of you so that you know when you go out home shopping and you find the one you can certainly take that down and make it your own so you want to work with your real estate agent to refer some uh, to you some of their go-to lenders we do this every day so we kind of have a feel of which lenders are going to do right by you and which will kind of delay things and mess around and not do well okay uh, we have great established relationships now a lot of my clients come and they already have uh, relationships established with their banks I say compare both. You want to get two or three quotes anyway and compare apples to apples to see who is going to be the best lender for you and give you the best deal. So let's talk briefly about three criteria that lenders will look for with you to determine how much they will qualify you for for a mortgage loan. You know, when you apply for a mortgage loan, in the lender's eyes, it's all about determining how much of a risk you are to them if they loan you money. Are they going to get their money back? The first thing that they'll look at is your debt to income ratio, often uh, known as DTI, if you hear it called that, debt to income ratio. And what that is, is the lenders take all of your monthly liabilities or your debt that's reported specifically on your credit report and they divide that by your total gross monthly income. So they'll look at your W-2s, your 1099s and all the reported income that you have. So it's your total monthly liabilities on your credit report divided by your total gross monthly income and that number yields a percentage known as your DTI or your debt to income ratio. Now, I'd like to say that if your debt to income ratio is about 20%, 
the lenders will love you. You're considered excellent. But if it's 45% or over, that means you're just a little bit risky to them. Now, FHA loans uh, sometimes will allow up to 53, maybe 54. Some of them push even 55% DTI. But it is a riskier loan and your interest, uh, your interest rate on that loan may not be ideal, but you can still get it done. So the lower the DTI, the better. The second factor is your credit rating. And I know credit is something that most clients talk to me about and they say, I'm working on my credit, I'm working on my credit. Let me say this, when you work with a good lender, the lender will take a look at your credit profile and map out a plan and say, do this, this, and that. They may even help you with some letters or some disputes or something, but give you strategic guidance and say, if you take care of this, your credit score will be this and we can qualify you for this. A lot of clients want to do this on their own, even before talking to a lender. And I just don't find that the best solution because you tend to delay the process. The thing is, is that what you are looking at is as important may not be what a mortgage lender looks at as important. They look at your credit and your debt totally differently than you may look at. So it really is important to work with the lender from the very beginning. Let them tell you what changes they want to see made on the credit report and then follow that guide and get that done quickly and you can get into your home more quickly. Um, let me say this. At the time of this recording, we're in the COVID pandemic right now. Prior to this pandemic, if you had a credit score of around 620-ish, that was considered pretty good and can push you right into getting down payment assistance and other things. But because of the pandemic, lenders are um, mitigating their risk and they're increasing credit score requirements. So you may need a minimum of 640. Some lenders require a minimum of 700. It really depends on the lender. But post pandemic, let's see if we go back to the 620. I know it was even possible po uh, previously before the pandemic, you could get an FHA loan for a 580 credit score. Your credit, um, your interest rate may have been higher, but it could get done. So, um, but the credit score is important. Let the mortgage lender guide you and shoot for minimum of 640 so that you can qualify for any and all uh, assistance programs there that may be available to you. And finally, the third factor that lenders take into consideration when they do the mortgage math and figure out how much they're gonna lend to you is loan to value. Now, this loan to value ratio really just assesses how much skin you have in the game. And it's something that the banks use to assess their risk when lending to you. Let me give you the textbook definition. The loan to value ratio represents the amount of loan you will receive compared to the purchase price of the home. So giving you an example, say you wanna buy a home that's $100,000, but you only have $10,000 to put down. Well, the bank will provide 90,000 you will provide 10,000. The bank is supplying 90% of that loan. You are supplying 10% of that loan. That makes your LTV, loan to value, 90%. Now, yes, that's some skin in the game, but not enough to make the lenders feel comfortable. So what do they do? They hit you with what's called mortgage insurance. Mortgage insurance premium. It's actually a mortgage insurance fee that is tacked on to your monthly mortgage payment that you will be paying until you achieve at least 20% skin in the game. So on a $100,000 house, after you've made enough payments, enough payments, enough payments, and you actually have $20,000 invested in the house, then your mortgage insurance premium can fall off and you will no longer see that as a part of your monthly mortgage note. Now, that happens, and this really depends on the type of loan that you have. On a conventional loan, yes. On an FHA loan, no. On an FHA loan, you're only required to put 3.5% down. So on a $100,000 purchase, that is $3,500 skin in the game that you put down. Now, it doesn't matter if you pay on that house uh, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and that you have 
50% skin in the game. It doesn't matter. On an FHA loan, that mortgage insurance, it's not going to go away. Once you accept that FHA loan, you will be paying that mortgage insurance premium fee for the lifetime of the loan. So what some clients choose to do is in order to get a lower down payment to purchase the home, they will purchase the home with an FHA loan. And then a year, year and a half, two years into it, they will refinance into a conventional loan to help get rid of that mortgage insurance. This is something that you have a conversation with me about and we can strategize how to take care of that. But just understand your loan to value is how much skin you have in the game and it is how the banks determine how risky of an investment you are. So you filled out your application with the lender and you've given them all this documentation. They crunched their numbers and they spit back out to you what is considered a loan estimate. Lenders should be giving you your loan estimate at least within 48 hours of you submitting your application. But once you compare one, two or three lenders and they give you the loan estimates, it helps you compa compare apples to apples. And what you can look forward to is comparing the loan type who approves you for an FHA versus conventional USDA, VA loans, whatever. You will also look at the interest rate, who approved you for the lowest interest rate, and then also what your monthly payment, your potential monthly payment will be. And let me say this about the monthly payment. Lenders are speculating at this point what your monthly payment will be because there's a few factors that they don't control that they will not know until you choose the one, the house that you want to buy. One thing is uh, property taxes. They can only guesstimate property taxes uh, according to the general area that you want to buy in, uh, but they won't know the actual property tax rate that will be factored into your monthly payment until you select that home. The other thing is homeowner's insurance. That is a part of your monthly payment. If you choose to have that escrowed, it will be a part of your monthly payment and lenders can only guesstimate what that amount will be uh, because you actually control that. You will go shopping for homeowner's insurance. You will buy the policy. That policy will be, that annual policy will be broken out into 12 monthly payments and that's gonna be added into your monthly mortgage payment. So those are two things that you need to keep in mind when you're comparing monthly mortgage payment and comparing that from one lender to the other. Pay attention to what they have factored in for homeowner's insurance and for your property tax payment because some of them play with that number and make it seem like they're giving you a, a lower monthly payment and it's not so. They're guessing as well. And then finally, cash to close. How much cash are you gonna have to bring to the closing table? And I work very closely with my clients on comparing one loan estimate to the other to help find out what's gonna be the best term and the best financial step for you and we use that as ammunition when we go out and shop intelligently to find the right home. Okay, we got through all of that. That's all the number crunch and stuff that goes on behind the scenes, but it's so important to do it up front before we get to the fun part. Okay, so how do you choose the one, the right home for you? I always ask clients to be very honest about what season they're in in life how long do they plan to live into that home? Can they anticipate things that may happen in the future that may adjust their living arrangements? And then finally, what are needs versus wants? And this is a big thing because when we go home shopping, you're gonna see some beautiful homes. You're gonna see homes that says, I gotta have that. And you're gonna be tempted to max out your budget and give up certain things that you become accustomed to in your lifestyle in order to afford that house because clients have done that. And I don't knock it because it's your money and you should have what you want. But I always remind clients, let's make an intelligent decision. Remember the loan estimate that we just talked about. Look at your loan estimate, be true to yourself financially and don't get in over your head. Just because the lender approved you for this much money, doesn't mean that you have to go out and spend this much money. Stay true to your monthly budget. Now, when you're determining your needs, what you absolutely must have, needs are what I consider deal breakers. That means when you go into a home, if it's not there, then it's a deal breaker. You walk away from that home. If you need four bedrooms and that home has only three, that's a deal breaker. If you need 
a master bedroom downstairs and that home has the master bedroom upstairs and that's a deal breaker, then that's considered a need. And you need to make a list of what your needs are, that if they're not there, they're deal, deal breakers and you're willing to walk away from that home. And then there are those wants. Wants are something that may not be physically present when we first go look at the home, but they can be creatively worked into the home. For example, maybe you wanted an office and that home is not built with an office, but there is a spare bedroom. Could you not convert that spare bedroom to office space? Maybe you really, really, really wanted a kitchen island. There's no kitchen island there. Well, you know, you can go on most of these uh, home clubs, these home shopping clubs and stores, and they have these huge oversized islands on wheels. Maybe you can get one of those and roll it in there and position it right there. And you have a huge island that looks like it was built right into the home. In other words, those things are considered wants because with some slight adjustments, you can make your home, uh, make that particular home fit your needs and your wants. So just be true to yourself. Know this before you go looking at homes and we'll talk through it. I'll help keep you honest and on track. So you have found the one. You found a home that perfectly meets your needs and your wants and you're really excited. So you're ready to put this home under contract. And this is the point where your real estate agent, moi, do what we do best. And that's get in there and write that contract and negotiate with the seller, with their listing agent, to tweak the terms in a situation, in a fashion that will work best for both parties. I always like to create a win-win. My obligation, my loyalty is certainly to you as my buyer, but isn't it a much more smooth transaction where both buyers and sellers get what they want and they're both happy? We always work to achieve a win-win. After all, it's a very large transaction for you and it's a very large transaction for the seller as well, but I'm always looking out for you and your best interests. All the games that we can play to get your home under contract. So this is the part where I will work with you, we'll talk back and forth, and in this market where there's potentially a lot of competition because the inventory is a little slim right now, I'll work with you to see what we can push and what we can get done to secure you that home. You got a pretty good track record if I do say so myself. All right, now that we have your house under contract, you have to come up with a little bit of money. This is something that I always talk to clients about, the upfront expense of buying a house, because most people just think I have until closing to put my down payment down and that's all I have to do. No, literally, as soon as you go under contract, you're coming out of pocket with option money and earnest money and inspection money, all within that first week of being under contract. Your option money, it's probably about $100, which uh, secures you uh, the next several days to inspect the home, to think about it, to sleep on it, to dream about it, and make certain it's the right decision for you. And you have the right to walk away, no questions asked, if you want to under that option period. So you secure that, and that money you're not getting back. If you do choose to move forward and buy the house, that money can be applied to your purchase price but that money doesn't come back to you if you choose to walk away. You're also putting down earnest money. Typically, earnest money is about 1% of your purchase price. Now, that amount is negotiable, and we can talk about that offline, but budget for 1% of the purchase price of the home. The title company will hold that, and in this video, this is not an exhausted um, talk about earnest money and option money and all of these costs. Just let me make you aware that they are there. Your earnest money can go towards your closing cost at the end and be credited to you at closing, um, but it is sitting there at the title company and it's just to keep everybody honest. But it is your good faith money to let the seller know that you are serious about purchasing the home. Then there's the inspection. Inspections are not required, but they are highly, highly recommended, okay, by a professional inspector. That's gonna depend on the square footage of the home, but I would say budget between 500 to $550 for an inspection. Now, boom, boom, boom. That was option money, that was earnest money, that was inspection money, all within the first week of going under contract. 
then you can rest, sit back for maybe a week and a half, two weeks, but then you're gonna need to pay for your appraisal. Normally your lender will order the appraisal and they will ask for your credit card number and your credit card will be run for that appraisal amount. And of course that cost will be credited to you at closing that you have already paid for that. So upfront cost, even before you get to the closing table, option money, earnest money, inspection, and appraisal. Be mindful of that and have a little stash reserved before you go home shopping. Now, just a brief word about the inspection. In your contract, you can specify that you will uh, accept the home as is. You know the house has been lived in and you're still going to buy it as is. However, during the option period, if there's some things that are just malfunctioning in the house and that are just deal breakers and you get the inspections done in the option period, you have choices. You can either A, just walk away from the deal altogether, or B, you can begin to negotiate with the seller about either A, the seller making repairs before closing, or B, the seller can actually credit you uh, repair money at closing, meaning they contribute money towards your closing cost with the idea that you'd be using that money to do those repairs. Or C, you could just simply negotiate the sales price. So there's a hole in the garage wall and maybe you just want to reduce the price of the home by that amount. Who knows? Everything is negotiable when you are working on a contract. So I always advise Give yourself enough option period to have a professional inspection done. And depending on the results of that inspection, if you need to have a follow-up professional inspection by a foundation guy, an electrician, a plumber, whoever, get it all done within your option period so it leaves us time to negotiate what we need to negotiate and make a successful and smooth transaction for you. Now, as a follow-up to inspections, I want to give you a brief word on appraisals. Appraisals are there really for the lender's sake to make certain that if they're going to give you $100,000 for that home, that the home is actually worth $100,000. This is especially important for FHA loans, VA loans, USDA loans, loans that are backed by the government particularly want that house to come in at the value or above the value that you will be paying for the home that they're going to give you a loan for. It doesn't matter as much with conventional loans. If you're going to pay $100,000 for a home that's only worth $90,000, you know, that's that's your business, right? Um, but when houses don't appraise, there's opportunity to further negotiate or walk away. And I'll leave that at that because appraisals can get a little involved and that's a topic for another video. But just be mindful that depending on the type of loan that you get, the appraisal can be super important. And if you are in a truly competitive situation and you are willing to pay above appraised value for a home, just know that you may be coming out of pocket. So if you're going to pay $5,000 above appraisal, you might want to have that extra $5,000 in your bank account and be willing to pay that at the closing table. Hip hip hooray, it's closing day. This is the day that you've been working so hard for, that you've been waiting for, that you've been working with your lender, sending documents, the same thing over and over and over again to the lender. And finally they say, okay, we got it. I hear that a lot from clients, <laughs> but it's finally closing day. You've gone over your CD or your closing disclosure at least three days prior to this day to make certain that all of your numbers are right. And now you're ready to sign that paperwork that's about that thick. But after you do that, we'll take pictures. You'll get keys and a garage door opener to your house. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. One thing that I want to say is that you need to be at peace with your decision, that you made the right decision. So after you buy a house, don't keep going out and looking at other houses. Be at peace with the decision that you made, knowing that you made a decision that met your needs and your wants and that you were financially responsible in the purchase of your home. After that, you just want to make certain that you make your payments on time every month. You want to make certain that you file for a homestead exemption. 
And there are several other things that I will share with you about being a good neighbor and being a good homeowner. But it's a joyous thing. <clears throat> it's a wonderful thing. And it's the right thing to do to purchase a home. I would absolutely love to be your realtor to hold your hand on your home buying journey. Please, if you have any questions after watching this video, you can call or text me at 972-591-1137 reach out to me on any of my social media channels facebook and instagram uh, you can reach out to me on my website tiffanyhayesrealestategroup.com remember i am here for you and we will have a happy home buying journey